if it's something little. And so that was kind of our activity for last week was to, oh, got to go along with my PowerPoint, was to um, generate a list of just like little five-minute joy activities and kind of try to practice those um, throughout the week or throughout the day, just little moments um, where you can connect with kiddos. So I won't ask you guys about that because neither of you were here. But today's theme of the day um, is called Mirror, Mirror, and it's going to focus on kind of that challenge and the process of learning to read and respond to other people in a relationship. Um, it's, I mean, it can be applied to, you know, foster kiddos and kiddos in your home, but kind of more broadly, just relationship in general, how we read and respond to others. So um, I'm not going to make you guys answer this, but just be thinking. So if you think of someone that you know really well, how do you know when they're upset or they're happy, or they're worried, they're stressed? Think about how you know when they're having some emotions. And then how do you know what they need in response to those emotions? Um, how can you tell if your response makes that situation better or worse? But just be kind of thinking of that as we go through today. Um, we know that being in a relationship with another person really requires you to be a detective a lot of times. Um, I know, especially in marital relationships, um, sometimes you just don't know what the heck they want or um, how to respond. And you can't really, it's, you can't read each other's minds. So you really have to be a detective and kind of explore those things. So if you think about your answers to the questions on the last slides, um, a lot of them might relate to nonverbal behaviors rather than verbal communication strategies. So um, I know that my husband's upset when he gets really, really quiet and kind of shuts down. Um, he doesn't say or do anything. Obviously, he's not saying anything. But when he's really, really quiet and muted, um, I know that he's probably upset about something. So a lot of those indicators for us are going to be nonverbal. And the better that we can read all these different types of communications, the more effectively that we can respond um, within the relationship. So sometimes we're going to get it wrong, obviously. Um, many of you may have had an experience where you felt that you were um, communicating how you felt and maybe communicating that you felt upset and the person that you were with either kind of missed it completely or responded in a way that just really made you feel invalidated. Um, so that happens sometimes, right? And that's because not two people communicate their needs in the exact same way. And so we have to learn a lot of different communication strategies because um, we can't just rely on the knowledge that we have of our own. So learning another person's community, or more, it's more of an emotional language. Learning that emotional language for someone else can be really complicated and it takes time, just like everything else that we talked about. Um, even in the most connected relationships, even in the strongest and um, longest relationships, Learning that emotional language is going to take time because our circumstances are always going to change day to day, the situations that we're in. And so it's really um, almost a lifelong learning experience of being with someone. So, and then a whole other aspect is um, cultural beliefs and practices and how those might influence a person and how they express uh, their emotions. Some cultures, um, emotional expression is encouraged and kind of celebrated. And in other cultures or families even, um, it, it might be more encouraged that you kind of uh, keep emotions to yourself, you remain really even keel, um, and that you kind of, uh, emotions just aren't something that you express freely. Keep that in mind too. So we kind of build this or um, fix these moments when we really get it wrong. Um, we do this by becoming an observer. And, <clears throat> excuse me, so when we're observing, um, we're actively attending to that information and we're reflecting on what we're seeing and choosing to respond in a way that makes sense based on what we've learned from our observations. And so if we're just reacting instead of reserving, ob reserving, observing, if we're just reacting, it means that we're being influenced by something outside of ourselves. And in some ways we're kind of being, um, we're at the mercy of what we're reacting to. So they have a little metaphor that they like to use here about being an air traffic controller. Um, if 
an air traffic controller, they essentially, they're a signal detector, right? Um, they have to be really purposeful observers. They've taken a lot of information and then integrate it together and then choose the best course of action. So um, if, there, if an air traffic controller is clearing a plane for takeoff, um, you know, they have to do a lot of things. There's a lot of components for that. And the, the key here is that they need to pull all the information information together um, into a meaningful whole that's going to make sense. It, if the controller reacts to every single bit of information that he or she um, sees individually, whether or not it's relevant, uh, the process of taking off is going to take forever, and most of us probably wouldn't fly anywhere. So if you think about children and teens who are affected by trauma, um, they're sending us signals or clues all the time. Um, but they don't always make sense, or they don't always feel good to the people around them, to us. And so it's really easy to react to those signals uh, without fully understanding them. So observing, essentially, is it's purposeful, it's active, and it's about more than seeing. So it's, it's going to be really nearly impossible uh, to be an observer if we're experiencing distress or overwhelming emotions. Um, ourselves that are kind of pulling our attention more inward. So, dang PowerPoint, I always forget. So we're really gonna observe by managing our own reactions and feelings, slowing down um, our reactions and using the tools in our self-care toolbox. I don't know if you guys were here for those sessions, um, but always keeping that self-care toolbox in mind, those in-your-pocket tools. And then we also observe by becoming an detective, like we just kind of talked about. So the skills, that we talked about in those previous sessions are the reason they're taught first is because they're going to be really essential to use in those um, in your pocket or ongoing self-care strategies um, really often or as needed. And those skills are going to help you to tune into yourself and support your own emotional regulation. So kind of, of focusing your attention inward um, so that you can really get to a place that allows you to observe another person, which is, you know, focusing that attention outward. Um, observing another person, it, it sounds really simple, um, but it can be really challenging a lot of times. And so to build the skill of observation, you really need to focus intentionally on your role as an observer. Um, the process, the observation process, kind of unfolds in different steps and <laughs> excuse me, involves being that detective. And it, so it's gonna start with noticing overt clues and patterns of clues that are used to communicate. Um, something about a need. So whether that needs related to safety or physical, emotional, relational needs, things like that. And so after that, being a detective involves identifying the underlying needs, driving those overt clues. So you kind of start on surface level and then dig deeper. And so the main goal is to, you know, use all this information to help you choose and guide your own personal response. Okay, and so and then what? After we're done observing, what do we do then? Um, you know, what do you what do you think the point is of, beco of becoming an observer? Um, becoming an observer would be really pointless if all we did was observe and didn't do anything with that information. What's important is that you're using what you observe to kind of guide effective responses, and effective is the key word here. So, imagine that you come home from work. I'm reading the slide here if you guys are following along. So imagine that you come home from work after a really hard day and you're frustrated and upset. Uh, your boss is acting like a jerk. Coffee spilled on your new shirt and traffic was terrible. Call someone and say, you wouldn't believe the day I've had and proceed to share the details of your day. Now, what if this friend, spouse, whoever, family member, what if you called them and they responded, you just need to get a new job. Uh, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. Uh, calm down. You're not helping yourself by getting so stressed out. Uh, why didn't you tell your boss that you wanted to be shown more respect? It's only a shirt. You can get another. So any of those responses. Uh, how do you guys think that you might react if someone responded this way to you? Any thoughts here? Well, it's not validating your feelings. Like someone could give suggestions maybe, but it's, it's mm -hmm. about validating that person's feelings first. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, if anyone, especially as an adult, um, if someone were to tell me to calm down, 
um, that would be so hurtful. And that's probably, you know, make me even more angry. Um, and the same applies to, you know, being a child, but we're going to, we're going to get into that. But exactly. These are all in that these responses don't validate the feelings that you're trying to express. So how would you want the person to respond instead? You want to respond um, in a way that's validating. Um, honestly, sometimes we just need to hear, you know what, that really sucks. Like that's crappy and, you know, I agree with you. And that's kind of all that needs to happen. There doesn't need to be suggestions necessarily for, um, you know, it's, it, can be, it can be easy to respond sometimes just by validating those feelings. So if we think about Olivia, um, how, how does it apply to Olivia? So let's say that um, she just arrived home after a really hard day at school. So she comes home after a hard day, kids were talking about her, someone laughed at her and her teacher said that she wasn't working hard enough. Someone wrote, you're stupid on her new notebook um, that her mentor gave her. Uh, she arrives home, slams the door and ignores your attempt to say hello. When you ask what the problem is, she says, school sucks, I don't want to go back. Now, can you imagine if a kiddo in your home did this or a child that you know, can you imagine responding in any of these ways here on the PowerPoint? If saying, you know, don't be so dramatic, don't slam the door, um, calm down, you aren't helping yourself by getting so stressed out. Why don't you just talk to your teacher about what's going on? Um, it's only a notebook, you can get another one. Stop talking to me so disrespectfully. So you can see these responses, um, some of them are trying to, uh, problem solve a little bit and then others are focusing completely missing how Olivia's feeling and focusing on things like don't slam the door don't be disrespectful things like that completely missing the point so we know that these are all really common reactions um, of adults when children have challenging experiences and it's really common to kind of um, in this kind of situation to try to fix the problem by asking you know why don't you just talk to the teacher or reacting to that surface behavior like the slam in the door, you know, don't talk to me disrespectfully. Um, and then also by minimizing the problem, you know, it's only a notebook, we can get you another one or invalidating the emotions like we talked about. Don't be so dramatic, you know, calm down. So, dang PowerPoint. Um, how, how would you answer this question? What do you guys think Olivia wished would have happened? when she came home from school. We were actually listening to her mm -hmm. and, and then further asking her, well, what, well, what happened? Talk to me exactly. What did you see? What was going on? And just like how uh, the other person said, validating about what mm -hmm. happened with her day. Mm -hmm. Rather, and then, uh, but giving her a minute, cause she's obviously upset. So she went to her room and closed the door. And, you know, and the reminder, you know, that you, we don't have to have that kind of relationship where you just shut me out. Yeah. Yeah. So that's really good. You know, giving her that initial space that she might need and then also giving her a space to feel comfortable to come back and process through the day. Um, you know, something saying, you know, let's talk about it. Like, tell me what happened. Things like that. Um, kind of getting those more details. Exactly. So if we let's. So let's kind of switch gears here and talk about mirroring. Um, mirroring is, because that's our theme of the day, mirror, mirror. Um, mirroring is a way of letting other people know that uh, you see them and that you understand them and their needs. Um, it's a really, um, mirroring is an empathetic response, an empathetic reaction. And when we mirror, we're actively reflect, reflecting back um, or sharing some of our observations with the person um, that we're observing and interacting with. And so when we mirror, we, um, we're not just observing those um, surface level things that we see, but what we think the emotion or need might be that's driving that behavior. And so mirroring is gonna help us to communicate um, in the moment. And over time, it's gonna help us to build really an understanding of the child or teen that we might be interacting with and kind of underscore to them that, you know, we're paying attention and that we care about them. Um, mirroring is also really important um, support for regulation and it helps children and teens uh, build awareness of their feelings and it really gives them, um, helps give them support and um, managing those, support and managing those feelings. So we're gonna talk a lot more in some other sessions about ways that we can help kiddos uh, with their feelings. So we're not gonna get 
too much into that right now, but we will come back to it. So how do you mirror through language? Um, Olivia, you know, slams the door and says, school sucks, I don't want to go back anymore. You can start by, um, you can communicate curiosity and interest. You, um, you can see in this example that Olivia's behavior, you know, slamming the door isn't addressed or um, reflected on at all in this response um, by saying, wow, it looks like something hard happened. Do you want to talk about it? We're not focusing on the door. We're not focusing on, you know, saying that school sucks, anything like that. Her foster parent is communicating the fact that um, she noticed that Olivia is uh, uncomfortable and she's communicating interest and understanding more about that discomfort. We can reflect affect um, by a response that says, I can see how upset you are. Looks like you have a really hard day. Olivia is really clearly experiencing emotion uh, in this example, and her foster parent reflects what she sees and labels the emotional state, which is upset. Um, and Olivia is showing that she's upset through her behavior and her verbal, verbal expression. So sometimes helping um, kiddos put uh, words or emotions to how they're feeling, verbalizing those in a concrete way can be really helpful. And then you can also um, mirror through language by reflecting cues, saying things like, whoa, that's a hard slam. Seems like um, you have a whole lot of feelings in your body. So in this example, the foster parent notices the behavior, you know, the slamming the door, and then communicates um, her understanding that the behavior is a clue of that big feeling that's happening. Um, so she's using that behavior that might be considered um, inner, un, unsavory, and she's using that as an indicator that, hey, something's happening on a deeper level here. You can also mirror through language um, by validating and normalizing. So if Olivia tells you, you know, some kids at school are being jerks and my teacher hates me, you can validate uh, by saying something like, you know, it's so hard to feel like people don't like you. It makes sense that you feel upset um, if you're feeling like that, that the kids don't like you and your teacher doesn't like you. Um, to validate someone's experience really reassures them that their experience makes sense. Um, here, Olivia's foster parent communicates her understanding of Olivia's perspective by um, talking about, you know, it's hard when you feel like people don't like you. She's just really stating in a simple way uh, what she believes Olivia's perceived experiences and, um, you know, which that perceived experience we've talked about before, it may or may not be grounded in reality, um, but we have to remember that people's experiences, um, they're kind of their truth regardless of whether or not um, it, it's, you know, really, really true. Um, that's how they're feeling, and so we have to validate that. Um, it's really worth em em I cannot talk. emphasizing um, that the foster mom isn't communicating about the truth of the experience. So she's not saying, like, oh, you know, that's not true. Like, I'm sure the kids are, you know, just joking around, or your teacher doesn't hate you. Um, she's really validating just the emotions that Olivia is expressing instead, um, reflecting the truth as Olivia perceives it. And so children or teens um, who've experienced trauma, we always go back to the trauma, they often believe that others um, think that their experiences lack validity or importance or truth. Um, and it's important to remember that that lens that foster children might be using um, it, it's really going to color their different experiences. We always, we're always going to talk about this lens. And so there might be times when we have to recognize that that perception is more important than reality. Um, and then normalizing. Um, if the foster mom said, you know, I can imagine how upset I would be um, if I felt like everyone's being too mean to, mean to me. Um, to normalize is to use a statement that tells the person that they're not alone in their experience. Um, and the point is to reduce the child or teen's experience of shame and isolation. So in this example, the foster mom communicates that Olivia feeling upset is really a normal reaction and that um, being in this situation that she's in could be upsetting for anyone, including, you know, the foster parent herself. And then language we know, excuse me, um, language is only one of the ways that we can mirror um, experiences, we can, 
you know, we talked about in the beginning how most communication is nonverbal. So finding nonverbal ways to mirror can be really powerful too. So that's mirroring through um, behavior. So we talked earlier about ways um, that you read communication in your own relationships. Well, I didn't make you guys talk about it, but we kind of thought about how we mirror communication in our own relationships and how a lot of these things are nonverbal. So, you know, those, that list of clues that um, kind of communicate to us someone's experience, whether it's tone of voice or facial expression, um, body tension, eye contact, things like that. Uh, it can be really helpful for you to mirror and match these clues by reflecting them back to your own behavior. So if Olivia angrily throws her things on the floor, um, sits at the table and puts her head down, you can match her nonverbal cues. Um, you know, maybe you could provide her with some space because you can tell that she's upset about something. Um, you could put your head down on the table too. Uh, just trying to um, relate to her in a way that makes her feel seen and understood. So there's going to be a couple things or phrases that we're going to want to stay away from. Um, we're going to want to stay away from those responses that are fixing, minimizing, limit setting, um, that try to change someone's feelings, that are invalidating, and that are pushing. So fixing responses are something um, that might start with, well, we can just do this. We can do X, Y, Z. Um, minimizing is, you know, it's not a big deal. It's just a notebook things like that limit setting is um would be you know i don't care how angry you are you can't slam the door that completely kind of skips over the um, emotional portion of trying to figure out what's going on trying to change feelings too quickly which um i never thought about this one you know hey like you had our day like let, let's just let's just go do something fun you know let's go get ice cream um trying to give the space to um, have that emotional reaction and process through it instead of just trying to distract from it. Uh, invalidating responses that say, you know, you know, it's silly to be so angry about, you know, just a notebook. Uh, and then pushing responses, you know, what do you mean you don't want to talk about it? Not allowing for the space and forcing kiddos to talk about things that they might not want to in the moment. Um, okay, that's it for that slide. So that was a very short session today. There was actually a couple activities throughout the um, session where we're just like practice mirroring things like that in groups. So I'm sorry that it's so short, but just to kind of use from today to wrap up, um, we communicate our experience in ways that go way beyond language. Um, you know, all those nonverbal cues that we discussed. Um, learning someone's language takes time and starts with curiosity. <laughs> sometimes we're going to get it wrong it's inevitable sometimes we're going to read people wrong um but instead of giving up we always need to be striving to continue to seek understanding in the situation um so a lot of times that requires slowing down and becoming a detective um avoiding just seeing that surface level behavior and kind of trying to dig deeper into what emotions trying to be communicated um of what need is trying to be fulfilled things like that and then mirroring what you see can be a really empathetic response. Um, so for self-reflection this week, um, they just ask you to think about a time when someone came to you with a problem and you felt like, like came to you with a problem, they were upset, whatever, and you feel like you responded really effectively. Um, try to think back to what your response was and how you knew that it was effective um, and why you believe it was effective. So that's just a little something to ruminate on throughout the week. And then for practice, for practice this week, um, they just suggest that you pick one person in your life to observe, um, whether that's, you know, a child in your home, you know, your spouse, um, a coworker, a friend, and see if you can identify clues that suggest that they're frustrated. <laughs> um, you know, so all those nonverbals, kind of look at their behavior, their eye contact, their facial expression, their tone. So just try to pick one person to observe this week if you can and observe all those nonverbals and how, um, what, what, what those nonverbals are communicating to you. And then it says bring the list to next week's session. You don't have to, um, but we can discuss if you'd like. 
so I'm again, I'm sorry it was so short today. There was a lot that we couldn't do. Um, but next session is Monday, June 17th at noon, like always. And then um, don't forget to fill out those evaluation forms um, that were emailed to you so you can get your credit. You will still get a one hour credit, even though we ended really early. And that's about it. Thank you guys so much for participating today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Have a good week. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Mm -hmm.